Open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm 119. Psalm 119. I mentioned uh, the last couple of weeks that within this series on the book of Psalms, we're going to have a, a few kind of sub-themes, and the first one is very decidedly a focus on what the Psalms have to say about God's Word. So we focused on Psalm 1 the first week, we'll focus on God's Word in Psalm 1, then Psalm 19, and then now Psalm 119, which I read this week one commentator that said Psalm 119, uh, it, it might be considered an exposition of Psalm 1 and Psalm 19. It's almost as though this psalmist uh, was, was expounding on in great detail uh, those earlier psalms. This psalm also uh, might be described as a book within a book. Uh, it is very lengthy. If you just turn through uh, in your Bible, turn the pages, you'll notice it has 176 verses. Uh, by verse count, it's um, nearly longer than half of the entire books uh, in the Bible. So if you go through a number of books in the Bible that are quite a bit shorter than just this chapter. So in some ways, it is a book within a book. And it is a book devoted entirely to the topic of God's Word. It's important to feel the effect of that, the length, the repetition, the intentionality of God's Word to talk about the Word of God. Now, obviously, there's no way we could cover this whole chapter uh, or even a section of it in any particular detail, but I think this, this chapter, partially because of its length, and because of its repetitive nature, it might be neglected at times among us. I don't know if you've ever felt that in your reading. Because it's so repetitious, it's easy, perhaps, uh, to neglect it, to assume you get it after the first few verses. And yet I think there's a, there's a treasure here for us to realize a principle, a value that we need. So I'm going to read a number of verses, not the whole psalm, but a number of verses this morning, and then we're going to launch in to talk about five different uh, aspects of God's Word that makes this so valuable to us. Let's begin reading uh, in verse 1. I'm going to read somewhat quickly uh, to move through a number of verses. Would you read along with me? Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart. When I learn your righteous rules, I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips, I declare all the rules of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in all riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. You rebuke the insolent accursed ones who wander from your commandments. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. Verse 41. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord. Your salvation according to your promise then I shall have an answer for him who taunts me, for I trust in your word. 
Verse 49, remember your word to your servant in which you have made me hope. This is my comfort in my affliction that your promise gives me life. Verse 57, the Lord is my portion. I promise to keep your words. Verse 65, you have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Verse 73, your hands have made and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Verse 81, my soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. Verse 89, forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. Verse 97, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Verse 121, I have done what is just and right. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Give your servant a pledge of good. Let not the insolent oppress me. My eyes long for your salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. Verse 129, your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, my soul keeps them. 137, righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. 145, with my whole heart I cry, answer me, O Lord, I will keep your statutes. I call to you, save me that I may observe your testimonies. I rise before dawn and cry for help, I hope, in your words. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promises. Verse 153, look on my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. 161, princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your words. I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. 169. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Verse 174. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live and praise you and let your rules help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Recently, we decided to introduce my two middle sons uh, to a slightly uh, more dramatic movie than they've watched before. Uh, so we've delayed uh, this particular movie for some years, uh, just wanting to not rush them in to too much drama too early in their years. We thought it was probably time, and so they had a movie night with us the other night. It's a movie with a good moral. It has a hero and a villain and sacrificial love and tragedy and triumph, and it affected them. During the movie, we saw one son wiping tears from his eyes as he was face to face with what the villain was doing in this movie, and he kept asking us, was it going to turn out all right in the end? Were they going to be okay? And when it was over, he turned to me, and with feeling, I think, that is beyond his words, he said, that was the best. <laughs> the triumph had taken place. The hero had won. There had been sacrifice, and the villain had been conquered. That was the best. And then they were up for multiple portions of that evening remembering and trying to get it out of their head. That was the best, he said. Well, that, that story is really a, a faint echo of the great story. Yes. It is a faint echo of the great story, the, the great story where there is a hero, there is a villain, there is sacrificial love, there is tragedy, and there is triumph. The great story, and I think that this psalmist in some ways, if he could boil it all down to one phrase, he might say it similarly. This is the best. It's the best. And I think that's what he's 
desiring to inspire in God's people. He didn't write this down only for his own benefit. He wrote this down, recorded it. They placed it right in the middle of this book of Psalms on purpose so that we would have a similar echo in our heart. This story is the best. This psalm makes it very, very clear, and given its length and its priority and and just the, the degree of verses that emphasize it over and over and over again, the sense is that God wants to impress something of the characteristic of the servant of the Lord on the hearts of his people, and it would be this. The servant of the Lord is passionate about the word of the Lord. Very simple. Very simple. That's the claim I think Psalm 110 makes on us and invites us to evaluate in our own lives. The true servant of the Lord is passionate about the word of the Lord. He's passionate about it. You will have noticed uh, the number of uh, passionate expressions. At one point in the psalm, uh, the psalmist says, I open my mouth and pant. He almost describes himself like a, like a dog desperate for water. I'm, I'm panting for your word. You have these phrases about how he values it more than many gold pieces. And he says, I, I love your law. Kevin DeYoung, in his wonderful book, Taking God at His Word, which I recommended last week and I would recommend to you, um, he opens the book by talking about Psalm 119. And he describes it as a love poem to God's word. I think that's a good description. It's a love poem to God's word. The, the psalmist is, is just passionate. He passionate in the way that a, a, a newlywed is passionate about their spouse. He, he wants to be near God's word. He thinks about it all day long. He can't wait to encounter the word again. He views it as essential to his life. There is a passion, a delight, a zeal for God's word that just comes pouring out of him in verse after verse after verse. And I think that same passion is offered to us. Not as a a duty or a drudgery or, or some kind of obligation, but as an invitation to see this really is the best. It it really is. It really is the best. It really is the thing that's worthy of our love and our passion and our zeal. As I said, there's no way I can go through uh, even just one of these sections thoroughly, let alone all of them. But uh, what I want to do is is offer five uh, themes or aspects of this word that we see running throughout this, this psalm and that are repeated thoroughly in this psalm that I think would help us to see why this writer and God views his word as so valuable. Okay, so five, five themes we're going to walk through and try to understand why this word is so delightful. The first is this, the God of the word. The God of the word. All right, I just want you to notice, look down near your Bibles, and I want you to notice, um, beginning uh, down there in verse um, let's see, verse 4, notice it says this. You have commanded, you notice, I want you to notice this word, your precepts. All right, you see that? It's, it's a genitive, it's a type of grammar. It basically means that these precepts come from the Lord, that he is the source of them. All right? You notice that word your. That's, that's trying in English to get across what they're saying. These are God's precepts. And then notice again in verse 5, your statutes. Then notice in verse 6, your commandments. Then notice in verse 7, your righteous rules. Notice verse 8, your statutes. 9, your word. 10, your commandments. 11, your word. And actually, we don't have to keep going because virtually every verse in this psalm, the vast, vast majority of them, Use some expression that indicates this is God's word. This is God's word. The point is this. This word cannot be separated from the one whose word it is. This word is God speaking. This is a relational word. It is a personal word. For this psalmist, to know God is to know his word. It's very important that we understand this. The relational element of the Bible is on full display in Psalm 119. 
The psalmist thinks that to know God, the way God has designed to be known, is through his word. And and that's not all that surprising. How would we know any person? Well, it would be by listening to them. We do this in pre-marriage counseling. You talk to a spouse, and usually mostly husbands, about listening to their wife. How do you know your children? By listening to them. How do you know any person? By listening to them. You don't know them by merely telling them what you think. You know them by hearing what they think. And so for the psalmist, the word is God telling us what he thinks, who he is, what he requires of us, and what he says about us. This is a personal word, and this is very, very important to me. The fact that this psalm over and over again describes it as as your word, your precepts, your commandment, your testimonies, and that that for the psalmist to, to, to know the word is to have relationship with God and to know God is, is to happen through the word, that is a value we must see when we come to the scriptures, whether privately or publicly. What is happening right now we're talking about God's word? We are listening to God. When we just read all those verses, God was speaking to us. Presently, right now. This isn't the biography of a long dead president or hero. This is the present communication of God. God himself has spoken, and we are listening. And that's why this word is so delightful, because the sovereign ruler of the universe, the supreme source of beauty and glory, the one who sustains all things, who made us and defines us and shapes our future and is the repository of any good thing we have ever seen, that being has spoken, and he has spoken in this word to us. The word is valuable because of the one who is speaking through it. That's why the psalmist is passionate. That's why it's the best. Because the best one has spoken. Throughout the psalm, the psalmist is determined that we would not see the Bible as as merely a religious book merely a collection of moral sayings. This is where I think people go wrong when they they use the Bible almost like a, a book of adages or advice, some of which they like and some of which they don't like. If you picked up a book, for example, on ancient Chinese proverbs or old American sayings of the Farmer's Almanac, you would find some things that made a lot of sense and some things that you didn't like very much, right? And you would be free to take some and throw them out and some and accept them and say, I I like that. And I think too often that's how we come to the Bible, as if it's a collection of, of helpful adages that various people have found useful throughout history, and we like some of them, and some of them seem a little archaic and out of touch. We have to come to the Bible as the spoken voice of God. And we have to see the Bible as necessary, essential, vital, central to a real relationship with God. According to the psalmist, there is no relationship with God that is not grounded in and sustained by a relationship to his word. Let me say that again. According to this psalmist, there is no relationship with God that is not grounded in and sustained by a relationship to his word. I think the psalmist would say, if we don't have a relationship with the word, we have no relationship with God. I don't think it'd be too strong to say it that way. If you look down there at verse 7, notice, notice what the, the combination in verse 7. I will praise you with an upright heart when? When I learn your righteous rules. When can you praise the Lord? When you know who he is and what he expects of you. The danger... Other than that is idolatry, to define God according to our own preferences and to praise that rather than to praise the God who is. And the God who is is only defined in his word. Notice verse 10. Verse 10 says, with my whole heart I seek you. And we like that. That's good. We want to seek God. We want to be those who seek after God. But notice why why he can say he seeks him. Let me not wander from your commandments. He's seeking God and what he defines seeking God as, as following the commandments of the Lord. 
To seek God is not primarily some uh, sort of emotional, subjective experience. I, I, I decided that I follow God this way. It's conforming life, mind, emotions, actions to the Word of God. To seek God is defined by God and made explicit in God's Word. So, so why does the psalmist view uh, this book as so delightful? Because it is the God of the Word who has spoken in it. The God of the Word is what makes it delightful and makes it his passion. All right, secondly, the godliness of the Word. Second element that he, he uses to define the Word and why it is so important to him. Notice these first two sections especially accent the application of the word blessed are those verse one whose way is blameless who walk a a wonderful biblical uh kind of metaphor for living life in a certain direction who walk where in the law of the lord blessed are those who keep his testimonies who seek him with their whole heart who also do no wrong but again walk in his ways you have commanded your precepts to be kept held on to pursued diligently without fail oh that my notice my ways my way of life my way of walking my lifestyle may be steadfast in keeping your statutes How do I know I won't be put to shame? Because I have my eyes fixed on all your commandments, and when I learn your righteous rules, I will keep your statutes. How can a young man keep his way pure? How do we know if we're pure before God? By guarding it, hedging it in according to your word. The psalmist sees the way that we walk and the fence around which we walk as defining purity and godliness before God. Here's another reason the psalmist values the word. Apart from the word, we have no idea what pleases God. We are left to our our conscience, which has been seared by the effects of sin. It is sometimes right and sometimes off. We are left to the commendations of this world, which is fundamentally in rebellion against God. We're left to the grand but limited expression of the heavens, that there is a God that we should follow, which is undermined by our disposition to rebel against him. We are left in the dark without the clarity of God's word. And so for the psalmist, since obviously relationship with God is the best thing and the most important thing, and honoring that God is is what it means to be in relationship with him well well then to have a book that defines what a lifestyle looks like that honors god is obviously glorious to him it is glorious to him have you ever had one of those experiences um and maybe this is just people like me who are too nervous about things but have you ever had one of those experiences where you're driving on a road and you've been going for a while and you're going at a pretty good clip and you haven't seen a, a speed limit in a long time and you're starting to feel, now maybe some of you just don't feel nervous about that at all. You think, hey, it's not my fault. I think it's 80. I mean, I'm pretty sure. But after a number of miles, it starts to strike me, and especially when you're kind of coming into those towns and you're starting to see civilization, you're thinking, uh, I don't, I think that slower is maybe better. I don't know for sure. And then you see the speed limit, and then you know. Oh, that's where it is. That's a little bit like what this psalmist is saying. I know. You're not deceiving me. You're not the speed trap God looking to catch me. I know. I know. Don't you you, you hate that when you're driving along, you don't know, and you're worried that somebody's watching with a standard that they've never really told you about? Have you ever had that experience? Oh, man, I, I, I had no idea. That's not the way our God is. He tells us exactly, very precisely, with page after page after page. And, and, and he's, not, he's not given us this long book because it's all full of different rules. He's given us one book with a lot of repetition because we need constant reminders. It's not particularly complicated to follow God. It actually is very clear in following God. What the psalmist is saying is, it's good to follow God 
and your word makes it clear how I can do that. Now, now brothers and sisters, here's what I think the psalmist would say to us. If you look at this, just those first two sections, we do not love the word if we don't conform our life to it. And if we don't love the word, then we can't love the God of the word. So if you just walk through the psalmist's logic, if you love the God of the word, who is the only God that there is, then you must love his word. And if you truly love his word, you want to conform your life to his word. Brothers and sisters, obedience has gone out of fashion among the very people who should hold it as the highest priority. It's not a popular word in the church to talk about obedience, obeying God, conforming our life to his word. Let me ask just a simple question that, that I'm convicted of and I, I, I imagine uh, many of us would be. Do we assume when we come even just to hear his word taught on a Sunday that our life will look different next week? We should assume that. Because every time we come to God's word, the assumption is that it is reaching into our life and calling us to conform to his holiness. We don't come to God's word for interesting instruction, but for life transformation. This is not an informational book. It's a transformational book. It's not just for advice or news about the way God has moved. It's calling us to live a certain way. And we can know that we love God and we love his word when that call, though difficult and though painful at times, is the genuine desire of our soul. So ask yourself this question. Does your view of obedience to the Bible match the passion of this psalmist? Do we desire to do as little as we can, or is our heart full of a desire to delight in the holiness of God? That's the definition of loving God's word when you see the glory of righteousness before God. You notice the psalmist is desperate. Actually, throughout the psalm, he, he both declares that he will walk in the way of the Lord and he cries out for help. Help me to walk in your way. I want to. I love your word. The word is not bad. I hate my sin that keeps pulling me away from your word. Help me to walk in your word, he says. So that the definition of loving the Bible is applying the Bible. It's not good for us, especially in the American church, when we talk about being Bible people, but talk very little about Bible application. It's not good. It happens even when we have, you know, small group gatherings and Bible study. We, we want to talk, it's easy to talk about, well, what is he saying? And it's harder to talk about what are we doing? But that's part of what it means to love the Bible. The Bible doesn't separate those things. James says you'd be like a person who goes to the mirror and is a catastrophic wreck at the end of the night and walks away doing nothing and goes out into his day. No businessman would do that. No, he's saying certainly no Christian should do that when they come to God's word and they see the life that pleases God. They should desire to obey it. Let me ask this question. When, when you gather, uh, say, in your men's meetings or ladies' meetings or small group meetings, are, are, we, are we sharing the ways that we're fighting to obey God's word? Or maybe do we only share uh, those kinds of prayer requests or interests that have nothing to do with our, our own obedience? Look, this psalmist is undoubtedly a very godly man, but he's desperate for a greater application of God's word. The understanding or the, the godliness of the word is, is one reason why he loves God's word. Thirdly, the understanding of the word. The understanding of the word. Look down there at verse 3, if you would. Oh, I'm sorry, verse 12 says, Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. Then look at verse 18. Open my eyes, one of my favorite verses in this psalm. Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. Then look at verse, verse 26. When I told of my ways, you answered me. Listen to this again. Teach me your statutes. Then verse 29, it says, um, put false ways far from me and graciously teach me your law. Then verse 32. 
I will run in the way of your commandments when? When you enlarge my heart. The psalmist's view of the word is that it is almost inexhaustible in its truth and its value. He doesn't view the word as something that he has reached the end of. Because throughout the psalm, he's constantly saying that, teach me, teach me, teach me. It's, it's a word that is understandable at first reading, but not uh, kind of explorable apart from the illumination of God's spirit. So the psalmist says, so glorious is this word, I need you to conduct personal tours of all of the value that is present. It'd be a little bit like we talked last week about the, the gold mine and, and how for the, for the psalmist, he comes to the surface and then he finds it getting dark as you wander into the cave. He knows there's gold there and he, he technically can wander down that hallway, but he has difficulty seeing it all. And so he's calling out for light. He says, come and, come and teach me. I, yes, I can read it. I can literally walk down the darkened hallways of Scripture. I can read it with my, with my eyes, but, but I want to perceive the value of it. So wh- why does the psalmist love the word? Because he perceives it as being so infinitely, inexhaustibly valuable that he is desperate for the Spirit of God to reveal it to him. Brothers and sisters, are we praying for God to reveal the inexhaustible riches of his word? Are we praying for God to show us how glorious it is? Or are we content at the opening of a gold mine that has miles of treasures for us to see and we stay there without crying out to God to bring light so that we can see more of it. There is light and glory to be seen in God's word, enough to bring us joy and passion and delight. But if we stay in the lobby, we won't see the treasure. God has called us to see the infinite glory of his word. But our minds are weak and shrouded by remaining sin and the effects of this world. And so we must cry out, show me the full glory of your word. Brothers, let let me ask you this question, sisters. When we come on Sunday, this should be the cry of our hearts. Teach me your word, O Lord. When we open the Bible in the morning and our soul is sluggish and our mind is sluggish and our eyes are sluggish, teach me. That should be our desire. I want to see. Show me the glory of your word again and again and again. Throughout the psalm, he claims this prayer of God. Teach me. Show me. I will know it when you show it to me. The glory of the word has not been seen by the one who assumes they can know it on their own. The glory of the word has not been seen by the one who assumes they know it on their own. What am I doing when I have a certain confidence that I can see what's needed in the word, when I go to it without this desperate prayer? I'm belittling the true value of the word. It would be like the person saying, oh, I know every inch of this gold mine, but you've never been down there with the light. How would you know what whole sections you've missed? How would you know what beauties you haven't seen? You you never asked for light or a guide. The assumption of knowing the Bible with very limited understanding of its depth is a tragedy in the church. When the Holy Spirit offers to illuminate it to us, I'm not saying that there's not great value in in the the obvious and surface reading of God's Word. I'm saying that 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 surface reading uh, gives way to greater and greater depth and, and power and beauty, and you see connections you didn't see before, and you see glory in the same verse you've read before. That's what I'm talking about. There's a there's a sight beyond even the the initial a uh, plain basic um, kind of understanding of it. That yes, a child can understand the glory of God's word, but we are to retain the childlike curiosity, but grow in our depth of maturity. I think this is what the writer of Hebrews says when he says, you, you, you should be moving on to meet, and I'm still having to give you kind of basic teaching. Look, some Christians spend their whole life drinking milk, not because there's some mystical meaning of the word. It's right there in front of us, but it does require that we at least meditate on it and think on it and cry out for God to reveal it to us. Let me ask you a, a hard question. When's the last time you studied something that required a desperate prayer for illumination in the Bible? 
When's the last time you, you went to a new section of Scripture that you, you don't know a lot about and you studied it earnestly and rigorously and desperately like the psalmist says, Teach me your law, O Lord. When's the last time we read a book that really stretched our understanding of good theology? Look, this is what this psalm is. He's desperate to see the depth of God's word. He is not content with the plain kind of surface, what I, what I understood when I was first saved, and I've never really moved on to greater maturity. He sees the infinite glory of the word. Okay, fourth aspect that's present in this psalm that I think help us to see the psalmist's value of it, the trial of the word. The trial of the word. Look down there at verse 21. You begin to see a bit of the context of this psalm, and then it really continues. Uh, the psalm is very repetitive, but there is a little bit of a progression. He starts talking about obedience. There's kind of a, a prologue or opening to the word. And then there's a, a lengthy section here where you see uh, weaving in and out of the discussion of his persecution. It seems that the psalmist wrote this when people were persecuting him and tempting him to turn away from God's word. He, he's afflicted. He references that throughout the psalm. There's a real desperation. And he says repeatedly that in the midst of his affliction, it's the word that he needed. So the context here is not of a man who's got his Bible open with a latte and a nice coffee shop and having a nice music play in the background. It, it's a man a conscious of great suffering and pain and temptation and persecution. There's a desperation to his need for God's word. There's a trial that he is facing. So look down at verse 21. Let's read some of these verses. You rebuke the insolent, accursed ones who wander away from your commandments. Take away from me. So we see a connection here. So these wicked ones are not just hypothetical. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimony. So apparently someone is scorning him. They are contemptuous of him. Then let's jump down a little further. Look down at 65. It uh, should be later on that page. 65, it says this. You have dealt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. You are good and do good. Teach me your, in your statutes. Listen to this. The insolent smear me with lies, but... With my whole heart, I keep your precepts. Their heart is unfeeling like fat, but I delight in your law. Verse 71, remarkable. It is good for me that I was afflicted, that I might learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. So whatever my poverty of life, what I have in your word is superior. Then jump ahead 78 through 88. He continues in this theme of, of affliction. Let the insolent be put to shame because they have wronged me with falsehood. As for me, I will meditate on your precepts. Let those who fear you turn to me, that they may know your testimonies. May my heart be blameless in your statutes, that I may not be put to shame. My soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. My eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? For I've become like a wineskin in the smoke. What an image. Yet I have not forgotten your statutes. How long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? The insolent, there's that word again, have dug pitfalls for me. They do not live according to your law. All of your commandments are sure. They persecute me with falsehood. Help me. Listen to this, remarkable. They have almost made an end of me on earth, but I have not forsaken your precepts. In your steadfast love, give me life that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. So one of the reasons the psalmist loves God's word is the word is present for him in the context of affliction, of trial. There's a, there's a trial that he is enduring. And he has seen the word in greater value and glory because of this trial. Actually, he comes to the, to the realization, as, as it says in the earlier verse there, that, that without this trial, he might have wandered from God's word. But he's actually great for, grateful for the trial because it redirects him to God's word. So one way we could say this is that the true servant of the Lord, when under trial, finds his heart drawn to the comfort of God's word. 
Let's test our own souls by that, by that test. Under trial, are you drawn to the comfort of God's word? Or maybe if you are under trial right now, and the temptation is to sort of medicate yourself through a thousand other distractions and comforting elements, but, but the servant of the Lord, he finds the word to be the purpose that God is using this evil trial for good, to draw him back to the word. So if you're facing a trial and you're suffering and you're going without, or maybe like this psalm, there are people persecuting you and painful in your life, the psalmist says the intention of that was that my, my heart would be chained to your word. The psalmist actually sees greater danger in prosperity and comfort than in affliction because he fears idolatry more than he, he, he fears uh, affliction and difficulty. The, the one who loves God's word fears idolatry more than difficulty. And so when the affliction comes, he views it as under the kind providence of God to draw him back to God's word. Brothers, we need to see affliction the same way. That's how we know that we value God's word when it really is our refuge in difficulty. Parents, when your children are struggling and doing things that are very difficult for you, allow that affliction to drive you to God's word. Those facing financial difficulty, when you experience the loss of earthly comforts, let that drive you to God's word. That's where God's word will be proven valuable to you. Th this man saw more of the glory of God's word because of his affliction. You want to be able to say like the psalmist does to the Lord with genuineness of heart, not with perfection, but genuine, genuinely, in spite of this persecution, I have stayed true to your word. That should be the desire of every Christian's heart. In spite of this financial difficulty, relational difficulty, uh, difficulty about the future, uh, painful uncertainty in my life, physical difficulty, I have remained true to your word. And that's not a burdensome calling because the word is what gives life in the trial. You notice how he uses the word. It's because of the affliction I was driven to the word. I'm able to say to the Lord that I have remained true to your word in trial. And that word in trial has given me life. His trust in the word is on trial. And the promises of the word have sustained him. The priority of his commitment to the word is being tested right now. So let me urge you to apply this to whatever persecution, suffering, difficulty you are facing in your life right now. Allow it to increase rather than decrease the priority of the word. The more you suffer, the more you need your Bible. The more you suffer, the more you need your Bible. The more you're not suffering, the more you should be concerned if you're drifting from your Bible. That seems to be his concern. If life is generally good, I notice frequently that I drift from a desperate longing for God's word. For the psalmist, a close commitment to the word is more important than a comfortable life. It's more important. Listen, this is the only way the church thrives, is if this conviction is present. It's the only way the church, it's the only way a Christian thrives, if commitment to the word is more important than a comfortable life. What prompts a person uh, to speak a word of encouragement on a Sunday or at a small group? They want to commit themselves to what God has said about the church encouraging each other. So they take that step of uncomfortable faith. What prompts a person to express their trust in God when they lose their job? A commitment to God's word and a trust in his promises. What, what causes a person to go out on a church plant and start a new church which requires a, a loss of income and maybe a, a separation from dear close friends? A commitment to God's word and seeing that the gospel going forward is the most valuable thing happening on earth at any time. What causes a person to step out in evangelism knowing it'll create an uncomfortable situation and may result in some kind of backlash? 
a commitment to God's word. Listen, it, we must be committed to God's word more than we're committed to a comfortable life. And this psalmist would tell us it is worth it. It is worth it. The joy I have in the word is better than the craving of that comfort without the word. The trial of the word has proven to this psalmist how valuable it is and how valuable God knows it to be because he allows even affliction to keep us from the catastrophe of wandering from God's word. Finally, the hope of the word. The hope of the word. You see this from the very beginning in verse 1 where this almost starts out. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. And then if you jump further ahead to the, towards the end of the psalm, Psalm 113, uh, he says, I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. Listen to this. You are my hiding place and my shield, I hope in your words. So it has this forward-looking uh, disposition. Keep reading. Depart from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commandment of my God. Uphold me according to your promise. Again, forward-looking, that he will continue to sustain, that I may live, and let me not be put to shame, forward-looking, in my hope. Hold me up that I may be safe and have regard for your statutes continually. You spurn all those who go astray from your statutes, for their cunning is in vain. All the wicked of the earth, look, this, this looks out into the future. You discard like dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. So the word represents the hope of the psalmist for the future. To turn away from the word means death. To turn towards the word is life. Look down at 145. With my whole heart I cry, answer me, O Lord. I will keep your statutes. I call to you, save me. For the psalmist, I think, to cry to the Lord and to keep his statutes is essentially one and the same thing. To go to the Word is an expression of trust in God. It's declaring a need for God. It's expressing that we want him to save us. Keep reading. I rise before dawn and cry for help. What does he do? I hope in your words. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate, what? On your promise. Hear my voice according to your steadfast love. O oh Lord, according to your justice, give me life. He's looking for an ultimate vindication. They draw near who persecute me with evil purpose. They are far from your law, but you are near, O oh Lord, and all your commandments are true. Long have I known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. Look on my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. It's remarkable. His disposition is one of hope. Even to the very end of the psalm, he says in 173, Let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, for your law is my delight. Let my soul live and praise you. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant. So throughout this psalm, you have this this forward-looking disposition. He's saying, look, I, I go to the Word because in the Word, God describes His willingness to rescue me and to save me. And certainly that is present even in the trials of this life, as he's referring to, a more immediate salvation. But I think if we read this in the context of Scripture, there, there is also this, this forward-looking hope that goes even beyond this life. There's a hope for the, the final vindication of God and for the ultimate blessing of God. And the psalmist says, it's because of your word that I have confidence in that final blessing. And when the, the unfolding of Scripture comes to us, we see that the, the coming of Jesus reveals the culmination of that hope. David is hoping for a salvation that has been described in the Old Testament and is revealed in the New. He's saying, I, I need a, a vindication, a salvation. I'm in the midst of an upside world right now, and in your word, I see promises of rescue and hope and, 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 and culminating blessing and vindication. I need that. And then we see the coming of the righteous one who brings that about. If someone were to ask me, how, how do we see Jesus in Psalm 119? I would say, look, in, in Psalm 119, the, the, the figure of Jesus is, is painted as if by a negative. His, his outline is seen in every longing and hope that David derives from God's word. He sees the fulfillment in Jesus that is to come. 
Jesus provides the comfort, the salvation, the promise, the hope, the future vindication, all of these things that David sees described in God's word. He says he's gone astray like a lost sheep. He sees his own need for salvation. And in Jesus, we see that salvation provided. He, he sees that there's a, there's a way of life that can rescue him. And in Jesus, we see that ultimately fulfilled. So that in union with Christ, as I've said before, you have to hold together the humanity and the deity of Jesus exactly. In, in each psalm, uh, these are true. Jesus is simultaneously the one who walks our righteous life for us and the one who provides salvation to us. Here's the point. Only in the word of God do we see the promise of God for salvation. If we want to have confidence in final salvation, we must find it in God's word. Let me make it very personal. If you want to have confidence in final salvation, it is described in God's word. David's anticipating it. The New Testament describes it as the coming of Jesus Christ who died for imperfect law keepers, who rescued them from their sin, who united them to himself and set them free to love and worship him forever. He is the ultimate word described in the word. So brothers and sisters, since this word ultimately describes Jesus, and since this is the means we have of knowing our God, and since it describes the way we should walk before him, and simultaneously the hope we have to get through this difficult life and finally to receive the blessing that is showered on God's people in the future, since that is what is present in this word, do we say of it, this is the best. This is the best story. This is what I need to know and trust and be rescued by my maker. This is what I need. This is the best. Let me urge us as a church, let's make this the best every day and every week. Let me encourage you. When you are waking in the morning, think about how quickly you can get to the best. When you are awake at night, find a way to get the best into your mind. When you are talking to your children, insert the best into that counsel. When you are preparing for your weekend, think about the best as the highlight of that weekend. When you are planning in your free time what to read next, Think about things and books that can help you know more about the best. When you're discussing how you're doing with your spouse, consider how you can insert the best into that conversation. When you are at community group having a discussion, think about how you can insert the best into that conversation. When you are listening to music, think about how that music can be music that fuels the best into your soul. When you are thinking about memorizing things and what's gonna be uh, something on your brain uh, day in and day out while you're driving, how can you get the best into your mind? Look, this is the best. Let's get the best into our hearts. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the overwhelming avalanche of descriptions of your word. Oh, that is beyond our comprehension how magnificent this writer viewed your word to be. Lord, we want to see more of that. So I pray, Lord, that you would illuminate your word to us. I pray it would be present in family time and in quiet time. I pray it would be present in marriage conversations. Lord, when young adults gather, Lord, would the word be present. But let us not constantly bring out lesser things and not serve the best.
Make us a church faithful to your word. In any trial, present or future, give us life according to your promise. Open our eyes that we would behold wonderful things in your law. Let every young man and young woman keep their way pure by guarding it according to your word. for the sake of your glory.